and uh, being among all these physicists and geophysicists, I don't know if you people are familiar with uh, American television, but I feel like Wallowitz in the Big Bang Theory, uh, <laughs> sort of a clueless Jewish engineer among a bunch of physicists. But anyway, that's, that, that, that's what it is. Uh, I just want to say a few words about Jay Feinberg and me. There are not many words to say. Uh, we share an interest in fracture issues. I was, I mean, we share an interest in issues related to mechanical stability. And, uh, and I think this is consistent with some of the things I, I heard took here. I like this definition of stability from Richard Bellman, that stability is a word with an unstable <laughs> definition. That's the best uh, definition I know. And I'll come uh, mention a specific instance of that shortly. And I'm going to talk about shear bands and just define what I mean. There's sort of an instability. Basically, a deformation pattern emerges from smoothly varying pattern and is associated with unloading outside the band. Uh, Jay and I, I think we both have roots in the Philadelphia area, is that in common. And he's played a significant role in introducing me to, to terms. At first, I was going to say concepts, but I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> but terms is really accurate. And people in the statistical physics community. And really, a new perspective, fluctuations and transitions in mechanical response. Until I met Jay, I thought these were called wiggles. Now I know they're fluctuations. <laughs> so I feel like I've grown up some. <laughs> and these I, I would call changes or, or curves, and now I know they're called transitions. So I, I've learned a lot. And getting back to the definition of stability, when I first got the invitation, um, because the closest contact I had with Jay was through fracture. I sent an abstract here, fracture. It had no, what I would call, stability issues in it. it had no wiggles in it. And after I sent the abstract, I saw what the title of the symposium was. So I quickly sent another abstract that I thought would have something to do with stability. And Aaron, Aaron Sharon said, well, from the perspe this perspective of this community, fracture is an instability. I never knew that. <laughs> I, I, I feel like someone told me I was talking prose all these years. <laughs> I had no idea. So anyway, that's why I mentioned that quote. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk ab about <coughs> work. Been doing, I should also say I'm only going to talk about modeling work, so no experiments. I, I may mention some other people's experiments. But I'll mention a bit about metallic glasses. They're attractive materials because of high strength, high stiffness. The problem is they're prone to these shear band type <coughs> failures, limits their utility in a wide range of applications. Uh, stress strain curves have lots of, now I know to say, fluctuations, not wiggles. And uh, very interesting, they're rate dependent. The period of them is rate dependent. And this shows there a range of strain rates for a given temperature where the higher, at higher enough strain rates, the wiggles disappear. So the fluctuations, amplitude, period can change, and it's temperature and strain rate dependent. OK, so it takes place by, by uh, local atomic rearrangements or soft spots, uh, termed shear transformation zones in some communities. It generally involves one or more shear bands. Ductility is typically pure, uh, poor. Failure taking place in or near the shear bands. Uh, it exhibits these fluctuations. And it's been carried out at the atomic scale, mesoscale, and also at the continuum scale, a lot of modeling work. Questions I'm going to try and look at some are, how do the shear bands initiate and evolve? And how do the she does the shear band pattern depend on geometry, including stress and deformation gradients? So there are a lot of uh, people who have been involved. I guess some of them in here. Let's see, it Itamar. Uh, Mike Falk, uh, 
There is somewhere here is Aaron Buchbinder and the whole lots of community. <coughs> At, uh, there's been a lot of it, atomistic modeling, continuum modeling, and at both these scales, people have looked at initial boundary value problem solutions, both at the atomistic and continuum scales. What, uh, and I should mention, my business is boundary value problem formulation and solution. That's, that's the business, I, the work I do. And what's been missing, I think, generally, are boundary value problem solutions at the mesoscale. Uh, and there's sort of two ways people have done things before. Uh, one due to Chris Hsu and his student Homer, uh, Homer at MIT. And what they did is they tried to, uh, they did represent f uh, the STZ fields, the transformation fields, by finite elements, and they needed at least 13 elements per STZ. If you have hundreds of thousands of these, that's not a winning proposition, particularly in 3D. This is just 2D. Uh, recently, uh, Bootchris and Schoenfeld and company have uh, looked at coarse graining uh, within a uniform stress finite element. So they get rid of all the initial uh, all the internal stresses, and they basically use the transformations uh, just to get plastic strain and use a conventional continuum framework. Um, for the uninitiated, <laughs> just find STZs. So oh, I did. I, I'm sorry, oh, okay. but but I'll do it again because I probably oh, I never didn't. Never understood it in the first place. Okay, well, <laughs> it's a group of atoms that undergo a shear transformation, and I'll show up. Oh, here's a picture. Uh, this is actually, sorry, <coughs> um, this, is, uh, this is sort of a, a car, this is an experimental correlation picture of the atomic displacements. Th these, this is what comes from just taking an Eshelby inclusion, undergoing a transformation where it just shears. So it's a region uh, in <coughs> physical terms of atoms that undergo some transformation. <coughs> Probably Mike Falk or, or Itamar could say it more clearly. Is that clear enough? I'll say it later. You'll say it later. Okay. And better. Well, well. Yeah. But, but that's, as far as I'm concerned, it's a region that undergoes a shear strain. It, if you it, imagine taking from a continuum perspective, uh, well, you take a, um, I think not exactly, but, but you take a piece of material cut it out, let it undergo a transformation, shove it back in, and then it's constrained, builds up internal stresses, and affects the stresses outside. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, I'm going to say, at this scale, I'm going to model plasticity's collection, continuum framework, but a collection of events that are discrete in space and time, there, uh, this enables these temporal fluctuations to be modeled, the spatial heterogeneity to be modeled, and what I'd say is the length and time scales in season experiments are typically larger than what you can model by atomistics. So you can get to large, although here we're still going to do very, very small uh, size scales, excuse me, but our time scales are going to be longer. Okay, disadvantage, the length and time scales are typically smaller than can be modeled continuum uh, framework. We need phenomenological rules to describe the kinetics of this transformation. And examples of such uh, mesoscale events are dislocation, <laughs> nucleation, annihilation, and glide, discrete dislocation, plasticity, and these shear transformation zones that I'm going to talk about. So our aim is to formulate and solve initial and boundary value problems with plasticity modeled as a collection of discrete events. And I mean, why? Uh, from an engineering perspective, microscale components and devices, the discreteness can play a significant role. It can even and often does have macroscale very large-scale consequences. 
examples include, um, in particular, I know with dislocations around crack tips. Dislocations, for example, can lead to very, very, they form organized structures, lead to very high stresses, has a big influence on fatigue, and can have an influence on things like hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, understanding the fluctuations in heterogeneity at this scale can give insight into the basis for designing material microstructures with improved performance. In particular, what we'd like to do for the STZs is look at developing microstructures that can block the shear bands and that can improve ductility. Uh, we can hopefully provide a basis for more predictive continuum constitutive description. Notch bars, the development and interaction of shear bands in notch bars has implications for developing tough, toughening strategies because these toughening strategies often involve in, in posing gradients. Uh, there, there's no unified view of notch effects on shear band evolution. Uh, a lot of experiments, I'll quote some later, that give uh, very different results on the effect of, of notches experimentally and see if we can rationalize them. Okay, so the approach we're going to take, I do continuum mechanics, continuum mechanics boundary value problems, we have dislocations or STZs. We want to solve boundary value problem for a region. So we know these fields analytically exactly. They satisfy equilibrium conditions, but they don't uh, meet the boundary conditions. So we need an image problem. Nice thing about image problems is even with dislocations, we have singularities. All the singularities are outside the region of interest. So we can use a standard method, numerical method, if we have, say, 100,000 or so of these or more, um, <coughs> to solve the image problem. And that's what we're going to do in either case. And then superpose, use superposition, and we have the, the solution. So we're going to use the Eshelby fields. We know them in 2D, 3D for the shear transformation zones for any transformation and they satisfy equilibrium and compatibility. The image fields, a standard linear elasticity problem, and then do superposition. And we, we're I'm going to talk about 2D. Our initial results are 2D, but 3D for these is not a problem. So we have quasi-static and, I should say, uh, inertial effects neglected. But on the other slide, I don't know if you saw it, there's another word with multiple meetings that confused me for a long time is equilibrium. When I talk about equilibrium, I mean mechanical equilibrium, uh, not thermodynamic equilibrium. Those are very different things. So I'm talk going to talk about mechanical equilibrium, not thermodynamic equilibrium. So we know the fields. We have initial conditions, initial state. Rules for, we would need rules for nucleation annihilation. We don't have them yet how to activate them. These are all phenomenological and would only really come from atomistic analyses. I don't think experiment would be very useful here and we need the transformation strain. Okay, so I'm going to talk about 2D plane strain. Again, by quasi-static, I mean a one parameter sequence of mechanical equilibrium states. Isotropic elasticity, so no residual initial stresses, that's probably very important. We could add that later. An initial random uh, distribution of <coughs> sites. Each site in 2D is a circle, easiest. With no nucleation or annihilation, we need that. We have an activation rule, and we use an elastic strain energy. Uh, critical value, we have put in a Gaussian with cutoff so we don't have very low, low or very high values. It turns out, and I think a number of people have used a uh, Mises of stress type plasticity criterion. It's really the same thing. Once you have isotropic elasticity, it doesn't matter. So what is five again? Elastic, the elastic shear strain energy. Due to the STZ? Uh, no, at a point. Any just at a point? Any, 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 due to anything. This yeah. is just a... The elastic moduli. Yeah. So it's a, the stress, the elastic energy at a point. We say you need a certain amount of energy to, to initiate, to activate it. The initial distribution of the STZs do not produce initial stress? 
Um, uh, no, uh, these, there are no STZs initially. I mean, we could do that. We have site. Uh, we have sorry, sites <laughs> that can be activated. One could uh, very directly, if we n really knew what was, I guess, right, and we can do this, is have them activate initially, s have no stress around the boundary, set up an initial stress state. We can do that. We haven't done that. So the randomness is just in the, in the bias, in the, in the threshold. Right, exactly. That's it. Exactly. Uh, yep. No, the size is fixed. Oh, yeah, the sites are pre chosen here. Again, that's a limitation. One expects they would be changed as. Uh, as the identifier, you reassign a random threshold? Uh, no, the re uh, the, the, what we do is, I'll s explain later, there's a threshold. Yeah. But, and then we say you need some relaxation before it can activate again. So we do a delay time okay. before it can be activated. Okay, that's the same, threshold. same threshold. Again, that can be changed. But what we try to do is just take the initial thing. Uh, also have some initial time for the transformation to take place. So we, we take it to be a much larger than an atomistic time. Uh, OK. Oh, uh, yeah, some numbers here. Oh, yeah, we have reactivation, this reactivation. Why do we do that? Because it's needed at a material point in order to obtain strains greater than the initial strain. We know that happens. Then, then the, and we don't know. And there are arguments that would say it really shouldn't be the same STZ. But we don't know how to do that yet. We don't know a good kinetic rule for that. So we took it to be the same one. But uh, at a material point, whether it's from the same one or a different one, you need to get more strain at that point. So, and we have a delay time in there that we just specify in terms of the. No, it's so from a Gaussian distribution. But there's cutoffs, so you don't get very low. One. Yeah. And there's also an atomistic analysis by Schoenholz et al. that they found the soft spots, or they claim the soft spots can survive 4 to 13 of these reactivation events. But there's some controversy about that. So I'm going to do <coughs> very small things, micron, quarter of a micron, size, notch bars. I'll show different notch geometries. Fixed density, this is about a half of the maximum packing density that we're, we're, we're taking for the, for the size that we have. And this is just going to pull on this. And what we're doing now, at least the first part of the talk, tension and compression just changing the sign. So there's no, no inherent difference. So we're going to look at a, a plain bar, an unnotched bar, blunt notch, sharp notch. And the number of STZs, depending on the size, can go up to close to 200,000. Again, this, this is just to show that uh, we can have 10 times or more potential STZ sites than we have finite elements, unlike in the method that was available and, uh, up till now. OK, so we do numerics. What are the numerical considerations? One is we wanted to check on convergence. So we looked at different meshes. And if you get beyond uh, about 1,600, things fall essentially on top of each other. You can see here in the cutout, uh, the curves begin to fall on top of each other. What's you, big measure? Uh, the stress. The overall stress. So this is the overall, sorry, this is the force divided by the width versus the imposed strain. And one thing you'll notice, I'll get into more detail, there are these stress uh, the drops, the bursts, and they're associated with bursts, obviously, of activation. And it depends on the notch acuity. Different notches have different burst frequencies. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. One thing that's nice about these is like if you look at the elastic energy, in 2D it goes down as the fourth power, 3D as units as sixth power. So like in atomistics, unlike dislocations, we can actually use a cutoff. So to speed up the computation, again, cutoff is large enough, everything falls on top. So we know what sort of cutoff, and it's actually seven, several hundred times the um, STZ radius. So have to be a little bit careful there. Okay, another thing I have to do is um, done dislocations. The nice thing about dislocations is when they reach a free boundary, they go out and leave a step. These things don't move, which has lots of advantages for computation. But one disadvantage is if it's very near an edge, it gives a high frequency uh, stress distribution, which the finite elements are not good at resolving. So we, we leave an exclusion zone now. We know how to, to, how to fix that. But for now, and these are the worst cases, we leave a, a zone around the notch, uh, <coughs> around the free surface, where no STZ activation is allowed. So does it always break after the peak? Uh, no, because we have no fracture. Again, this is just... So why does it go down to zero? When you uh, break? Okay. When you go to each time, you get softening yes. due to the relaxation of elastic energy. And so the energy just goes down, I down. It's the same threshold, so it, it, it fires again and again and again. Again, yeah, exactly. Okay. It can fire again. again and that de depends on the delay time. Sometimes you don't get that going down. If they refire very frequently, you do. Okay, so we have unnotched bar results. Uh, this is a, ga a case goes down. How do you load the bar again? Just tension, uh, the displacements. Constant, Constant rate. Constant rate. Rate, yeah. So well, actually, here it's 0.1 per second, and I'll show rate dependence later. So we can vary the rate. Yeah, boom, exactly. So you see you get shear bands that form. There's a in stress, strain. This shows how many times something activates. So you can get here up to about four activations in a shear band. Gives larger drops. Here the distribute, oh, we pick the angle to be the angle of the maximum shear stress. So we just say whatever, whatever maximum shear stress is, that's the angle. The angle depends on this delay time. If there's a long delay time, the, angle, the angles are sharper. If there's a short delay time, it's spread out. You uh, can see, I think, I'll try to do one of these. Yeah. The way, what we see in the development of a shear band is the shear band doesn't propagate. It really goes by a percolation type phenomena. So we see a percolation type phenomena rather than a uh, prop, uh, something forming and propagating like a crack. Also, you can see as the shear band forms, you get some unloading around it so that uh, in this case, you, you get the shear band. Sorry? Well, we, we went through a, a factor of four of system size. You still get this non dynamics. That's what we saw. But again, still very small systems. So we, we don't know when you would when you get that. And we really have to look at this, at some of this a lot more. Yep. Oh, the avalanche. Yeah, avalanches oh, occur. Yes. But it's within the same, same time step? Oh, yeah. Within the time step. One time step, you can get a bunch of, that's, you can get big drops within, boom. Yep. yep. And, and not quite. Not on tension, not on your axle, only on shear. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not quite 45 degrees. But it, it's, it's, no, here. It's, a paper about this, it's not 45 degrees, no? <laughs> <laughs> this is a simulation, yeah. 
Sim simulation here, it's close to 45, but not quite exactly. We have the angle. Well, you can see, I'm sorry, I'll go back further. Here's 45. It's peaked around 45, but there's a distribution. Because when you activate something, it changes the local stress state, which changes the maximum shear direction. So what we find is it's not exactly 45. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what are the statistical effects? What we find, which is, un, uh, I guess, uh, was surprising to us, and is, and, and maybe not so surprising, we get more scatter for larger bars than for smaller bars. Just the opposite of what happens with dislocations. Dislocations, you see more scatter for smaller bars. Here we see more scatter for larger bars because once these avalanches start. Uh, so smaller bars, practically no size, uh, no statistical effect, at least what we've looked at. Larger bars, and depending on this reactivation time, but you get different, more different results. So there's a statistical effect at the opposite of dislocation. Uh, we see a rate effect, and now we can do rates from 10 per second down to 100th per second. And uh, the, the number, the activations, the drops, the, the slower the rate, the larger the drops we get. And the more uh, fluctuations in the stress strain curve. So we can look, we haven't done the statistics, but we can do histograms of the drops. And here you can see it um, one hundredth per second, lots of large drops. Go down to one tenth a second, the number of avalanches decreases. Ten per second, nearly nearly a smooth curve. And again, at high rates, and, and of course what we do is not at all accurate, not physically accurate, but what it does say is the time scale is very important here. And perhaps the statistics of these drops uh, and these um, uh, avalanche effects give a lot of insight into what is the time scale of the governing process. Okay, what also happens with rate, see at 10 per second you get much more homogeneous type of deformation. Slower rates, again, the, these large avalanches occur in shear bands that just form naturally. So there's a strong rate effect in these materials on the shear band evolution. Do you any viscosity? Sorry? Do you any, viscosity in the any viscosity? No. There's no viscosity. There's only the, and actually we don't know what is the, really the governing time scale. Uh, there's the time for the transformation, there's the time for the reactivation. Our kinetics are, are highly, highly idealized, and we need to do much, much better kinetics. But I think it says that the time scales involved, when you get up to the mesoscale, are very important. So, of course, there's no size, there's a size effect, and there's an effect on, on the low drop. And again, it depends on the time scale. The material time scale is, uh, in our, at least our calculations indicate that's very important for determining the size effect. Okay, and here you see again, larger, this is larger size, asked about the size effect. This is a factor four in size. You see the shear band pattern depends, varies with size. You get more of these, uh, 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 shear bands in larger specimens. <coughs> okay. Sorry? Yeah. The width? Yes, we do. I, uh, it's, it's in a paper we wrote, but I think, if I remember correctly, it may say something here. Uh, I wrote it down someplace. But I think, depending on the size, we get some widths that initially increase a bit and then seem to stabilize. That's what comes out. 
And it's, I think, maybe in the order of 10 to 60 nanometer type widths that come out. But I, I, I don't know the numbers. And you can see the size effect on the stress drop. The magnitude of the largest stress drop increases with the size. And the size scale there. The fraction of the smallest stress drop does not vary with size. Do you know how it increases with the size? Uh, the, the sh uh, well, one or smaller? I uh, the answer is, uh, okay, the answer is, I don't know. It's in the data. Um, uh, it's there, but I don't know what it is at this point. That's the answer. But yes, that's a, it's a significant question. So the stress drops that give the fluctuations in the stress strain curve are associated with these bursts of activity. So there's a definite burst. Now we go to notch bars. I'm almost done. So one thing that happens there, this is just in case you see, the orientation spreads out because of the stress gradient. But you get shear bands that form. Again, the shear bands start, don't have, I, don't, I may have it later, but it really looks just about like the slip line field theory. Not quite perfect plasticity, and, but then, of course, that would be symmetric. The statistics breaks the symmetry, and you get one band that dominates. And I think I may have a picture here. I'll try and I'll do one of these. I won't do two, but you see the stress is increasing. This is elastically, begin to get some nucleation, stresses increase. Then as the band forms, the stress comes in. You get unloading associated with the shear band. But again, it doesn't propagate, it percolates, more or less. Okay. Yeah, they're blobs, blobs of activation, boom, 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 because of the interaction, exactly. And then the blobs link up, exactly. So just do one thing of sharp notches. Again, spread out the orientation. Um, shear band pattern differs. A lot of more activation occurs. This is different from plasticity because it propagates perpendicular in that direction. Uh, okay, I can, I'll do one more movie and then quit the movies. Yeah, so you see it loads up. You get the stress concentration elastically, things that blobs that form. Now get begin to get a shear band that begins to form here and links these up. Okay. So here's some observations. There's for ductile materials, one gets something called notch strengthening. You take the force divided by the width between the notch, <coughs> look at notch bars, it's greater for a notch bar than for an unnotch bar. For brittle materials, you usually get notch weakening. The, the force divided by that width is less than for a bar without notches. Here, experiments that show notch weakening. Here, are experiments that show not, notch strengthening. So you see both of these experimentally. What comes out from our very simple calculations is that depends on this re reactivation time. So you can get notch weakening if these reactivate quickly. It gives more brittle type behavior. More uh, time between these reactivation events, you get uh, more ductile type behavior. This is not at all accurate. I wouldn't claim that this represents real materials, but what this suggests to me is, again, the time scale for making more strain, whether it's new STZs or reactivating old ones, is key for understanding how these things respond to gradients. Uh, and what, what that affects is how the hydrostatic stress develops in this field in, in the region between the, the notches. Here you, here you get more localized hydrostatic stress. Here you get more spread out hydrostatic stress. Um, other things, so well, this. The, the faster they are, the more ductile they are? No, the more brittle. Oh. No. 
opposite. So the size effect also depends on the notch acuity. Unnotched, at least in our case, has the largest size effect here. See the bigger size effect here. Um, blunt notched, then a sharp notch. It goes away. Because things here are dominated by right near the notch, the high gradients. So the size effect goes away for sharper notches. OK. Um, uh, the fluctuations and notch acute. So what we, uh, these are, yeah, f five minutes. OK, about two more transparency. Uh, they found more or less regular fluctuations at an imposed stress uh, strain rate of 10 to the minus 5. They found about 8 seconds, peak to peak time. Then it went 2 seconds, then 0.4 seconds. But you said it's a system size dependent, so This is the same size. Same size system, different rates. So same size, different rates. Not, not uh, OK, we see the same trend, but different times. Uh, so we, we, we go from um, about 0.06 seconds to 0 0.04 seconds. So if you were to scale this up linearly, we're about a factor of three or four off from what the experimental, but the trends are the same. So again, I think the time scale of these oscillations or uh, fluctuations is, is very important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, everything's the same. The material's the same. We just, right, we just do. Uh, everything's the same. I mean, we can, we, yeah, we, we, t we say it's the same material, everything the same, just change the loading. Okay, so what we need, and this is actually from, we, we talked with Aaron, we talked with Michael and, and Bill Curtin, and they really encouraged us to do something more physical. And we're working on that now. But one thing we could do very quickly is account for transient volume change. What happens, and there's some indication that as these things shear, they, they expand, but then they go back. Uh, so we modeled that very simply by having, again, as a function of the transformation time, goes up to some peak volume change, comes down, and we can leave a residual volume change or have it go back to zero. Uh, what was surprising to us is it makes very little difference in the stress strain curve. Very little difference, whether it's tension or compression. We expected some tension compression, asymmetry, doesn't happen. What that suggests is maybe it's the initial stress state more than this volume change that determines the tension compression asymmetry. Uh, one thing that's different, <coughs> compression, tension, no volume change at all. This is just the uh, 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 residual uh, mean, mean uh, volume change. And you see here, tension and compression give, di although the stress strain currents aren't very different, tension gives much more localized shear bands than compression. So it's softer in there. And I won't go through there. I'll just make some concluding remarks. So the discreteness carriers of plastic deformation has a major response on the mechanics at the mesoscale. I think superposing explicit solutions or analytical solutions with numerical solutions to enforce the boundary conditions enables a wide range of these phenomena to be analyzed. We can do indentation, crack tips, all that. Key weakness we have is what is the physics of the kinetic region. But we get fluctuations both in space and time. Shear bands emerge. The pattern is specimen dependent. 3D is no fundamental difficulty. We hope this provides insight for the development of macro scale constitutive relations. One important thing I think at the um, macro scale is we know these materials are isotropic. So we know, say, the plastic flow is determined by three, the three invariants. But it's not necessarily just the second invariant, like many of the constitutive equations have. So what are the role of the first and third invariants? We can look at that here. So we can 
once we get more accurate uh, kinetic rules, we can look at uh, two, uh, shear band blocking microstructures. What happens if we put in a lot of holes? What about we put in some crystals, which we can do dislocation plasticity for? Uh, inclusions, we can uh, use this as a virtual tool. We need it to account for finite geometry changes. That we know how to do for dislocations, we can port that here. This is the key thing we hope to get from people like Aaron and Michael and others. Uh, more physical based rules for STZ nucleation, evolution, annihilation. And we can improve the numerics, we haven't paralyzed the code yet, all kinds of things like that. Uh, another thing is I think this basic formulation can be used for a variety of phase transformations where the phase transformation can be mod uh, idealized in terms of SLB inclusion. For example, some smart materials. Um, there's some, <clears throat> really some people believe that uh, um, high entropy alloys deformed by both uh, dislocations and STZs. So this provides a, a tool for that as well. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>